I'll be there. Two weeks from now. But you went to to the easy meeting, right? Yes. Yeah. You've been traveling more. I think from the spring till now, it would, it would be until the end of the year. I should be have something like well. Yeah. of Lokim at EPL in the uh, Kosiak of Sanic. And mm -hmm. Kosiak, uh, the capacity is uh, over 500 people. I think I was there once. Yeah. 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 No, it, it probably you weren't the dining area. There is the auditorium itself. Ah, okay, so what? A bigger one. Yeah. And five minutes before. Right. Well, there it is. Happening here too. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can recognize people. Uh, yes. I cannot. Huh. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to start today's colloquium. I'm Valentin Pilet, I'm the director of the National Solar Observatory. And we had an opportunity to propose speakers. Uh, we decided to bring here today's speaker, which is Noor Rawafi from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. He's going to be talking about environment near the sun because he's the project scientist for Parker Solar Pro, a mission that I'm sure all of you have heard about the great discoveries that he's doing. Noor did a master in astrophysics in 97 in Toulouse, France. Then he got a PhD in astrophysics in year 2000 at the University of Paris, Orsay. I then moved for a postdoc to MPS in Göttingen and then to NSO. He was with us at NSO in Tucson for three years. And after that, he moved to the John Hopkins APL where he's been ever since. He's a staff scientist at the APL. And in 2018, he was the project scientist for NASA Parker Solar Pro. His expertise is solar magnetic fields, measurements, me measurements of the solar magnetic fields, including the coronal magnetic fields, a very difficult cool topic. Now with Parker Solar Pro, he's measuring the magnetic fields of the solar corona in situ. You guys are touching the sun, as you like to say. And Noor, thank you for being here. And please, your Thank you, Valentin, for the kind introduction. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, uh, being in Boulder is always nice. It's, it's a nice place to be in. And uh, um, Actually, for NSO, I was there for four years. Yes, four years. It's, uh, I was before my time. <laughs> yes. Um, so um, anyway, um, instead of naming the, the talk about Parker Solar Probe, and, and I, I was thinking more about the near solar environment, because uh, we are living um, kind of exceptional times now with Parker Solar Pro, uh, Solar Orbiter, DKs, and some other uh, missions as well. It's it's very very interesting now to. Uh, uh, okay, let me make it closer. Is that better? Is it better now? Yeah. Excellent. OK. So um, it is, we are, what we are living now are really exceptional times. And uh, I would probably argue that in the last 50 years, there is no better time to be a heliophysicist. And, uh, um, and you will see it. Um, unfortunately, one hour is not sufficient to talk about everything. 
but I'm so lucky that I believe not long ago, uh, David Malaspina gave a colloquium. He covered quite a bit of uh, Parkinson's probe, so I will not uh, go into uh, some of the material he talked about. There is no need to repeat that. And uh, um, anyway, um, if you look back at the history of um, solar and heliophysics in general, um, there were key times where certain discoveries were made and they changed the course of research in, in that field. And I'm gonna just mention a handful of examples. And uh, I think the first that come to mind, obviously, is the discovery of sunspots by Galileo in the early 1600s. And from there on, we, we came to, uh, to discover the solar cycle. And the solar cycle is a whole domain of research that we are still trying to understand. Another example, and I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with, and which is the discoveries of white flares by Carrington in the uh, 1859. And from that, that discovery actually was the birth of what we call now space weather. Again, it's a big, huge thing. But these two discoveries here, it took us decades to realize what is the, the cause of this phenomena. And it all has to do with the magnetism. And that's the discovery by George Hale in 1908. And I will be talking a lot about magnetism. And the observation by Hale is very simple. It's the many fact. When, when, the, when you cross the, uh, the sunspot, when you cross the sunspot, you see the zimin splitting. And if you read the abstract of his paper, the last sentence, he was stating that this discovery will change the course of our research in solar physics, and indeed it did. Since then, it's, it's, it's all about magnetism. Um, fast forward to the, early, to the late 50s and uh, early, um, um, this one should, should not be 1930, yeah. but it's, it's okay. So um, 19, uh, late 50s and early 60s, we discovered what we call the solar wind. But this discovery was actually at the dawn of the space age. And what we learned from all the missions we, lost, we launched in space, it changed completely our, the way we regard the, uh, the sun and its environment in general. Why I mentioned this, uh, these examples of pivotal uh, discoveries in heliophysics? Because we are probably living one of this golden era of, uh, of heliophysics research. And this is thanks to Parker Solar Probe, which is getting closest to the sun ever in about uh, two years from now. That's actually the eve of Christmas 2024. We will hit the closest approach ever to the sun. That is 3.8 million miles from the solar surface. Um, a, a, a little later, um, Solar Orbiter will be out of the ecliptic by about 30 degrees. It will give us the first view of the solar poles. And that is extremely important to understand the uh, solar cycle and the dynamo in general and the, um, and the interior of the sun. And obviously, we have Dickies, the largest solar telescope ever built, the four-meter telescope. Um, if you go back just a few years back, the resolutions that we, uh, Dickies will give us, which is about 10 to 20 kilometers, we were only seeing in the numerical simulations. Now we will see it in observations, which is which changed our view completely, and they will provide some um, uh, hints to what Dickies might might give us. <clears throat> so, what are the the questions that we are, we want to understand about the uh, near environment of the sun? And there are many of them, but here I will give just uh, five of them that uh, uh, probe, orbiter, and Dickies will address. The first one is what we call the coronal heating, and it's very simple. This was discovered in the late 30s, it was, it is a, over eight decades ago. And when you look at the photosphere, which is the surface of the sun, it's about 6,000 degrees. Move 3,000 kil kilometers above, and the temperature of the plasma will spike to more than a million degree. And for the last 80 de decade, for the last 80 years, we are still trying to understand what is going on there. The second phenomenon, and which is very closely related to the coral heating, and you cannot explain one without the other, but this one has to do with the solar wind. Close to the sun, the speed of particles is very, very low. We are talking about a few kilometers per second to 10, 10 kilometers per second. 
but over short distance, the plasma starts flowing at hundreds of kilometers per second, meaning they are gaining energy from somewhere. That somewhere is what we are trying to find out. And when I say that you cannot explain the coral heating without solar wind, it's for a simple reason. It's the same plasma. And when you inject energy into the system, some of it will go into thermal form, some of it will go into kinetic form. So you heat and you accelerate the plasma at the same time. So if we come to understand the solar wind, we will explain the, the, the heating at the same time. The, um, the other phenomenon which is closely related to what Carrington discovered is whenever you have an explosion on the, uh, on the solar atmosphere, the corona, in the form of a flare or uh, CME, and these do not have to be big, by the way. Even the small ones can accelerate particles to, the, to a good fraction of the speed of light. These particles are what we call energetic particles, and they are a hazard to space equipment, to humans in space, to, uh, to even on the ground here, whenever we have a huge event, it can make disruption. And the best example of all of that is the 18, uh, 1989 power outage in the northeast uh, of, the Ameri uh, of America, where you see it spreading from uh, north of Canada and going all the way down. It's, it's pretty impressive. And obviously, I talked about space weather. It goes without saying. All of these phenomena lead to space weather, all of them. And uh, uh, a good example of this, just a few months ago, SpaceX lost nearly 40 spacecrafts. And they lost them because of a mild event. It's no, it was not even a strong event. That's the effect of space weather. And if we want to, to, to send women and men back to the moon and Mars, we have to know how to, to protect them, and protect them exactly from what the sun is doing through these three phenomena here. Now, you can look at these phenomena. They are kind of, um, in terms of time scale, they can be short time scales. They occur on short time scales in a way. But globally, on longer time scales, they all come to what, what we call the solar cycle. And we often talk about the solar cycle that, il il is, that is 11 years long. In reality, it's 22 years long because it is magnetic. It's, it is a f uh, it's nature is magnetic by, to start with. So this uh, phenomena, all of them and many others, is what Parker Solar Probe, Solar Orbiter, and DKS will address. Um, now, let me start. I, and as I said, it all has to do with, di with magnetism. So where the magnetic field comes from? Obviously, it comes from the interior of the sun and through the uh, dynamo, uh, dynamo action that basically transforms the uh, dipolar uh, magnetic field into, into a horizontal field because of the differential rotation. And that rotation will strengthen the field over time until it becomes buoyant. And when it becomes buoyant, it emerges to the surface in the form of sun, sun, sunspots and, if, and even smaller, smaller active regions that we call ephemeral regions and, and bright points. Um, and this is actually what leads to the 22-year-long the cycle of, of the sun. There are several flavors of the dynamo theory, but I think the most popular one is what we call the alpha uh, dynamo model. Um, uh, you have the buoyancy that uh, leads to the emergence of the, uh, of the flux, and once it emerges, it rotates, forming like an omega, uh, omega shape. That's why the, the, the name came Alpha Omega uh, Dynamo Model. So what are the pros and cons of the, uh, of the dynamo? Obviously, from the models we have right now, we can explain the solar, uh, we can reproduce the solar cycle, the 11 years or 22 years solar cycle. But there are limitations. For, and this one, I put it in gray because some might dispute this a little bit. But in general, most of the models that we, dynamo models that we have, they are axisymmetric. They assume, they assume that the um, dynamo is symmetric around the, um, the, the rotational axis of the sun, which might not be true. And I will come later why we people resorted to this assumption. It's simply because we are observing the sun from one single viewpoint. 
and that is extremely limiting. Um, uh, one more thing, it does not necessarily account for the large scale field. It reproduces very well the strong field regions like sunspots and active regions, but the large scale field we need a little bit more. And, and obviously it, we need to understand what is going on and, and uh, the interior of the sun in terms of uh, flows and, and uh, uh, flow, the convective flows in general. But this is where all the magnetism of the sun come from. But to see the manifestation of the magnetism, you have to go to the atmosphere of the sun. That's where we see it clearly. It's, it's, uh, this is an image of a solar eclipse that is the 2000 solar eclipse, 2008 solar eclipse. It was during the uh, deep minimum when the sun was completely quiet. And you can see it here from this uh, EUV image here. You can only see bright points on the sun. There are no active regions. But when you look at the structure of the corona, it is extremely complex. And it is actually that complexity that drives the heating and the acceleration of the wind. That's what we have to understand. And you can appreciate better the, um, the uh, solar magnetism when you look at animated uh, sec image sequences from in EUV in particular. This is 171 from the Solar Dynamic Observatory. And look how dynamic it is, extremely dynamic. So let me come back to the science of probe and orbiter and other. So the main thing that we, one of the main things we want to understand is the solar wind. How it comes about, how it is accelerated, and, uh, and all of that. But before going into this, into that, let me explain, uh, let me define what we mean by the solar wind in a way. I'm pretty sure you are all familiar with it, but just a re as a reminder. We have three regimes of the solar wind. When we are at a solar minimum, like this one here and this one here, we have, in a way, two modes of the wind. We have the fast wind that is coming from the solar poles, the open field region of the poles, but the slow wind coming from the equatorial region, and it's extremely variable. It has a lot of variability in it. When we are at solar maximum, this bimodal structure is lost, and we have streams of mixed wind, fast, fast and slow. Uh, when we, get, we go back to the minimum again, we gain, we gain that uh, bimodal structure. So the fast wind, it has typical speeds above 600 km per second. It is coming from open field regions that look on holes uh, on the poles or on the, in the equator as well. And it is alvenic. And in a minute, I will define what I mean by al alvenicity. The slow wind has velocities that are typically below 500 km per second. It is typically non alvenic at 1 AU, although from time to time we see streams of uh, slow alvenic wind. But the big problem is where this, this wind is coming from. You look in the literature and people argue that it's coming from the quiet sun, from active regions, from the coral hole boundaries like, like here. And Basically, basically all over the disk. But in reality, we don't really understand. We don't know where it's coming from. And that's one of the big questions that we, we want to answer. There is a third regime of the solar wind, is the transient solar wind. And that's basically the uh, transient events like coronal mass ejections. So the open question about the wind, um, and this is a movie from, uh, from Suvi and, on Goes. Um, I think this is a 174, uh, 171 uh, uh, channel. So the, f the first question that we want to answer is, what are the physical processes that give us birth to the solar wind to start with? And this has to do with the base of the solar corona. The other f um, um, question is, we know what we measure speeds lower down in the solar atmosphere. They are way below the escape speed of the solar gravity. The escape speed of the solar gravity is about 600 km per second. And the speeds we are measuring are, are in the tens of km per second. If we are, I mean, the highest will be probably 100, 150. So these are not sufficient for the wind to escape on its own. It has to be heated and accelerated along the way to escape. And where, how does that happen? That's another question that we want to answer. And there is, a, there is a third question that 
people are always uh, want, to, want to know. When we measure the wind far away from the sun, and by far away it can be just a uh, few tens of uh, solar radi radii, the field seems to be a continuous flow. But at the source, lower down here, is it continuous or is it inter intermittent? If it is intermittent, it has to be created by individual events. If that's the case, what are these events? So and here I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit of, about albinicity and what Parker Sorrel Probe um, told us about albinicity. I'm going to talk about this panel, the second from the top. The red curve is the uh, fluctuations in the magnetic field. The blue is the fluctuations in the velocity of the plasma. And when you look at them, they are highly correlated. If I, I remove the, uh, the notation and tell you which one is the velocity and which one is the magnetic field, probably you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to say. And why they, they, are, they are this high correlation? It's because the wind is highly alvenic, meaning the alvenic fluctuations in the wind are so dominant that basically impose this, kind, this, this correlation between the two. And this is, the, this, is the, this is the thing that we learned from Parker Solar Probe. Earlier in the previous slide, I said the slow wind, the fast wind is alvenic at 1 AU. The slow wind is mostly non-alvenic. But what Parker Solar Probe measured so far, slow and fast wind, the vast majority of it is alvenic. There were a tiny bit of slow wind that is not alvenic. So there is a, an explanation, and there is a lot of hand waving in this, into this explanation and saying, OK, for the fast wind, it's fine. When it is coming from the open field region, it's born alvenic. It will continue to be alvenic. But for the slow wind, if you have a structure like this one, which is a kind of a pseudo streamer, lower down here, you can start with a fast wind. But because of the super radial expansion of the field, the field will turn into slow wind very shortly. But it can still keep its alvenicity. But there is a lot of hand waving here into, into this explanation. It might, it might happen. It's, um, it's not. Uh, but the really question is whether all the wind is born alvenic to start with, except some of it will lose its alvenicity as it propagates out. And if that is the case, how it loses its, its alvenicity and where it loses it, these are another question that we need, we need to answer. And it seems to be the case that all the wind is born alvenic regardless whether, whether it is slow or fast. And uh, there are hints in, 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 the, in, the, in the data that, that goes to that. And I'll allude to it a little bit. So by alvenic, do you mean magnetically dominated or something more? The alvenic fluctuations are, 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 pretty, uh, um, they, they are pretty dominant in the plasma, the alvenic. OK. Um, we, have, we have fluctuations in the magnetic, magnetic field. These are the alpha waves. And they have, if they, they are strong enough into the plasma, they will impose the, the, basically the dynamics of the plasma. That's, that's what, what it means. Yeah. So now let me move to something you might have, have heard of. It's what we call the magnetic field reversals of switchbacks. And by the way, these were not discovered by Parker Solar Probe. These were observed by Ulysses, by Helios, and they believe even wind before. Except far away from the sun, you see them every now and then. You don't see many of them. But when we got to close to, um, to the sun here, this is the first encounter, by the way. It was at the, the perihelion was at the 36 solar radii. We saw this. Um, high amplitude fluctuations in the magnetic field. Just for the history, we saw this two days before we presented this data to the, at the AGU. It was a Tuesday. And for probably 10, 15 minutes, we were thinking there is something wrong with the instrument. What is the y-axis? 
this is the radial uh, magnetic field. I think it was cut. I just zoomed it too much. But it's the radial uh, magnetic field here. So it took us about 15 minutes to realize, no, this actually, what we are looking at here are structures in the solar wind. Far out, we see the low amplitude fluctuations, which, what, which we are used to. But these ones are kind of new. And you see a ton of them when we get close to the sun. So what are they? There are two possibilities. Either we are, we are, they are current sheets. We are basically changing polarity of the field. Since on one end, it is uh, about minus 100. On the other hand, it's about 100 nano Tesla. Or they are folds in the magnetic field of the field line. These are the two, two possibilities. The second one is the right, the right one. And there are two reasons for it, why we know it's the same field line that is basically folding on itself. First of all, when you look at the uh, strength of the magnetic field, it is nearly constant. If it was a current sheet, we should, we should see a drop in the strength of the field. We don't see it here. But the stronger evidence is when you look at the pitch angle of the straw, the el electron straw, which is a beam of electrons that follows the, uh, strictly follows the field line, field line, the pitch angle does not change, meaning that the electrons are fo following the fold, uh, the shape of the, of the field line. And that's how we know it's the same field line. So um, these are re refer reversal, definitely, on the, on the, uh, on the f of the field line. They come with um, plasma jets. Whenever you get a switch back, you get also a plasma jet with it. And that's because of the alvinicity of the plasma. They carry a lot of energy with them. And I will give just one, one example in the next slide about the uh, energetic uh, aspect of the switchbacks. Obviously, they are highly alvenic. They are abundant close to the sun. But this property here is probably even more important than the switchbacks themselves. They come in groups, like this one here. This is a patch of switchbacks. On either end, we have a period of quiet magnetic field. And we have the group of switchbacks. On the other hand, we are also have a quiet period of the wind. Are the switchbacks, are you seeing the switchbacks in the length of time because the field is changing or because the spacecraft is going through uh, a field? It's both. But we are actually crossing the fold on the, on, the, on the magnetic field. You have the S shape, which is the switchbacks, and the, the spacecraft is crossing it. Okay. Do you yes. have a feel for which of the two dominates? It depends really how you cross that, that thing. Sometimes if you cross it, if, OK, suppose that you, your, uh, your switchback is like this, and you cross it perpendicular. But sometimes, uh, sometimes you cross it a little bit oblique. So it, it really depends. So, but what we know about them, they are very elongated structures. We know that. But uh, your question is, is a good one, and it's not easy to, to handle it. So, um, <clears throat> OK, they occur in patches. And this is what is going to lead us probably to the source of the solar wind. Not the switchbacks themselves, but the patches. OK. This is just an animation uh, showing what, what we mean by folds in the field. It's like, like this one here. It's, uh, you just have, you have a switchback, like a mountain switchback in the field. Now, about the energetic aspect of it, this is, uh, an, ideal, this is an ideal switchback. Um, and you have the field rotating almost 180 degrees. But look at the speed of the solar wind. We started with a slow solar wind, about a little bit above 300 kilometers per second. Um, while we within the switchback, we have a fast wind that is seven, about 700 kilometers per second. When we got out of it, we came back to slow wind again. That is how energetic these structures are. Now, what do they do to the plasma? Some of it. Some of that energy is deposited into the plasma in the form of heating. These are patches, like this one here, like this one here, and this one. Whenever we cross one of these patches, we got heating of the plasma in the perpendicular direction of the field. But oh no, actually, in the parallel, sorry, in the parallel direction of the field, the perpendicular temperature is almost constant. 
This is what we get from the data. In a way, it's counterintuitive because the first thing we thought about is we get more heating in the perpendicular direction of the field because of ion cycle and other things. But the data is suggesting otherwise. How this heating is done and what is the physical mechanism, it's still, still not clear to us. But we know that the switchbacks are definitely depositing energy into the plasma. And once we move further out, all, that, all these switchbacks kind of disappear from, from the magnetic field, from the measurements, meaning they are dissipating somewhere. And that energy obviously is, is, uh, is provided to the plasma in the form of heat and, and speed. There again, we need, we need a little bit more data to get understanding into that. Now let me go back into the, how the patchiness of the switchbacks, these groups of switchbacks are going to lead us to maybe the, the source of the wind and also how the wind is, is, come, comes about to start with. Before that, let me define what we call the uh, chromospheric network. When you look at the large scale field away from active regions, on the solar surface, uh, photosphere or chromosphere, most of the field is concentrated at the boundaries of, of cells like this one or this one. This is what we call supergranules. And the field where either polarities will be uh, immersed at the interior, but it's pushed by the, uh, by the convection, uh, the convective motion of the, of the plasma to the boundaries here where it is concentrated. What is the scale size of this um, of these uh, supergranules is about 30 megameters in diameter. And they live about a day or a little more. Now, when you look at the size of the, of the patches, the switchback, uh, switchback patches, it correlates so well with the scale size of the supergranules. There are two papers last year about, about, about this. And that has, was the first hint that, yeah, maybe this patchiness of the solar, of the switchbacks actually originates from the base of the solar corona. That's, that's a hint. It does not mean that all the switchbacks form at the base of the solar corona. We might have another flavor that form in situ. We cannot rule that out. But at least some of them seem to be coming from the, the base of the solar corona. What is the process? We know that there is jetting activity in the, uh, at the, at, in, the, at the, in the corona, and we know that from the time of Yoko, like this jet here, it's a, it's a big jet. But the issue with that type of jetting, we don't have enough jets to create all what we are seeing in situ. Per day, we have something like less than 200 jets for the whole hemisphere, and that's not enough. It must be something different. Now, this is a filtered image uh, uh, movie from SDO at 171. When you look at the raw images, off limb here, mo all you see is almost a haze. But once you filter the images, you start seeing this, this dynamic, um, dynamic in the off limb here. And you see it very clearly at the poles of the sun, but it's also elsewhere. What we are seeing here are tiny jets. We call them jetlets. And the nice thing about them, they are everywhere. It's not like you see them in one place and not the other. They are above the poles. You can see them very clearly, but yet they are also elsewhere. And it doesn't matter where you look. You can have a movie that extends over a whole solar month. You still see them, meaning that this type of activity occurs all over the solar disk. It is not only limited to a certain time or, or something like that. Another properties of this type of activity is it does not depend on the solar cycle. Whether it is minimum, maximum, you still see it. It's like the solar wind and the heating. They are also solar cycle and dependent. And that there might be a link between this and the wind itself. And just by eye, when you look at the motion here, it kind of leads you, yeah, we are seeing the flow going out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a zoom now on the, on the solar pole where you see it way, way better now. Look at the jetting. It's there all the time. And these are short-lived jetlets, jetting. They live for from 
several tens of seconds to several minutes, and they are gone. These were discovered in plumes on, on disk back in 2014. I wrote, I wrote the first paper about it. But now what we are discovering, they are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. Look at the pole, by the way. You have an arrangement between bright, dark structures. Remember the patchiness of the switchbacks. You can imagine that when the spacecraft's connected to one of these, we will get a patch of switchbacks. Once it moves out of it, we will get probably the quiet period. Nor what's the time scale on this video? Uh, this one goes for several hours. Several hours. I, I forgot the, but it's, it's, uh, I think it's probably six hours. Yeah. But as I said, you can, you can do this for days and days and days, and you will still see the same thing. So what is it all about? Uh, by the way, this is a much higher resolution uh, image from Solar Orbiter, where the resolution is just 10 mega, mega, 30 megameter. And this structure, elongated structure, is those, switch pad, the, those jetlets we are talking about. That's, that's what we are, what, what we are uh, finding. Now, what, what is, where does it all come from? When you look at an HMI magnetogram, and by the way, uh, the resolution is, is one arc second. It's not 1.2 arc second. What we see, we see the strong fields in the network, like here and here. But inside, we don't see much. The, there is probably hints that there is a diffuse uh, fields there, but we don't really see much of it because of the resolution, but also the sensitivity of the instrument. Now, move to much higher resolution, that is from uh, the Big Bear Solar uh, Observatory, the GST, the Goody Solar Telescope. The resolution is 0.2 arc second, and the instrument is pretty sensitive. Look at the landscape, completely different. By the way, these are exactly the same areas. This, field, this uh, element here is this one. This one here is this one. Look at the number of pipes we see lower down. In 90 minutes, in 70 by 70 arc seconds, we counted nearly 1,500 pipes that were canceling. Meaning, our connection is ongoing all the time at smaller and smaller scales. <coughs> Let me see, I have, I have, oh yeah, this is the movie. Look at the dynamics here. There is one thing I didn't say about this. Here we have quiet sun, and here we have, we have uh, a coronal hole. When you look at the magnetic structure, you don't really see much difference between the two. Meaning that the rock connection at small scale, it's omnipresent all over the solar disk. And by the way, also in the network here. And the network potentially is open to the higher up, to the high altitudes of the solar corona. And they are a source of the solar wind. And um, why I'm saying it's a source of solar wind, the first paper I think that was published uh, that hints that the solar wind is coming from the network, it's by Don Hustler, who was over there. It was in 19, was it 1999? 99. 99, yes. And using SUMER observation, where they showed that the, you have um, um, upflows in the network, uh, above the network elements. Now we kind of understand what is going on here. So how do we link? Basically, what we are doing here, we are linking the small scale magnetic connection to the jet tank to the in-situ measurement of Parker solar flow. We believe that the wind is born through tiny explosions in the form of jetlets that occur all over, all over the place. And that's actually the result of magnetic filter connection at small scale. And this magnetic filter connection does not have to be only on open field regions. It can be also in closed loops. And when it happens in closed loops, what it does, it hits the plasma. So now we are, we are kind of arguing that we kind of getting closer and closer to understanding the source of the wind, but also the heating of the plasma. 
What is also nice about this reconnection scenario here is that whenever you have reconnection, naturally you will create alpha waves. Alpha waves will serve, for two, will serve two purposes. We need them higher up to keep the wind accelerated and hot, but also we need them to create the switchbacks. Because at least a class of theories uh, of the formation of the switchbacks is that you can start with a low amplitude alpha wave lower down, but when it propagates higher up because of the background field is dropping down, the amplitude of the wave uh, grows. And at a certain point, they will step in to form the switchback. And that's, that's the nice thing about, about this, this uh, 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 reconnection that is, that is everywhere. This, by the way, this, um, this work here has been submitted to, uh, submitted to Nature, and uh, uh, it will go under review hopefully soon. And uh, if one of you is the reviewer, please. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Let me go a little bit. Also here, is, uh, this is the high resolution, um, highest resolution EUV image we ever got from EUI on Solar Orbiter. And look at the complexity lower down, and also the dynamics. All of this are because of reconnection. Reconnection seems to be the most dominant thing lower down in the, in the solar atmosphere. Now we know, we know it is. What we need from DKIST, is way, way better observation than what we get from BBSO. And I think what DKS is going to tell us, the amount of reconnection we measured with BBSO is going to be just a fraction of what we will see with, from, from DKS. And that the reconnection will occur at smaller and smaller scale. And when, you, when it goes to the jet tank, what we believe is we are, actually it's, it's a whole spectrum. We are probably in the upper part of it. But if you go to high and higher resolution, we should see more and more of it. Theoretically, we will end up with the nano, nano flares that, uh, that, part, uh, that uh, Gene Parker theorized uh, in 1988. This is not everything that Parker Solar Probe observed. Remember that we launched Parker Solar Probe in 2018. It was a deep minimum. The sun was extremely quiet. But when we got there, closer to the sun, we started observing tiny energetic events, uh, events of energetic particles, like, like these ones here. They are very interesting. They are small, and they kind of get diluted uh, further out. We don't see them at 1 AU. But closer to the sun, we see many of them. And they are fascinating in the sense they kind of behave like the larger events. And they are mysterious as well. If I get this triplet here, four, uh, three, four, and five, we think they are all coming from this region here. We kept flaring. It's, they are tiny flares, not big flares. We think they are all coming from here. But this is the problem with that. When you look at the composition of event four, it's totally different from the composition of event uh, three and five. And you, look, uh, you can look at the composition in the lower panels. These are, uh, I believe it's helium. No, this is the protons. This is the helium. And this is the electrons. There is a strong variability in the composition of these events. And if they are all coming from the same active region, why do they have different composition? Which is, which is kind of strange. The point I want to make about this is when we were talking about this, the two camps, the NC2 camps and the remote sensing camps, if you go back to before Parker Solar Probe, the, these folks here, they need only contacts from these. But with the observation closer to the sun, we are really talking details. One of the suggestions from uh, modelers on the NC2, they are saying, you know what? We might, uh, we might actually have differential composition to start with on the solar, uh, solar uh, uh, at the base of the corona. And they are basically asking us, can you, can you verify that? Can you get hints about that? That's this type of uh, observation from close to the sun. It's bringing everybody together to work together, which is, which is pretty nice. And with DKS, I'm pretty sure we'll get more of that. Um, um, another thing which is a big milestone for Parker Solar Probe is we always wanted to fly through the solar corona. And we did it. We did it in 2021 in the Orbit 8. 
how do we know that we, obviously when we, we, we are observing all these big CMEs, the Milky Way, and also collisions of CMEs like here, look at them, one, two, and three, three CMEs colliding together. But how do we know that we are flying through the, the hemispheric kind of when we, when you fly through structures, some of them will fly above the spacecraft, some of them will fly underneath the spacecraft. And that will result in, in an apparent motion that the, um, the structure above the spacecraft will be moving uh, upward in the field of view. The other ones will be moving downward in the field of view. And that's exactly, let me play it again and you will, you will see it. Uh, okay, why it's not playing? Come on. No, we don't want that. Okay. At a certain point, you will start seeing features moving up and features moving down here. That's when we are flying through the solar corona. But the nice thing about it, look at the small scale dynamics and small scale structures that we see there. There is a ton of them. Look, look here. Now, now. It's a huge amount of them. So, meaning that within the Hellisphere country, there is a lot of stuff going on. Probably a lot of it has to do with reconnection. Um, lots of it has to do with reconnection. So, we need to look into it. What, what is going on there? So, yeah, with probe and orbiter and dickest, we will lear we'll learn a lot. But still, there is a lot of knowledge gaps that we need to fill with um, in the future. And now I'm moving from now to the future in a way. When you look at the, when we look at the sun from a single viewpoint, in particular the measurements of the magnetic field, the measurements we do are reliable only 60 degrees from the center of the disk. And that is only a quarter of the total surface area of the sun. At, even, at any given time, you are only covering a quarter of the total surface of the sun. Magnetic fields are highly dynamic and they are changing all the time. And if you don't follow them, you lose information. Remember that we use this type of measurements to drive our coronal models and our hemispheric models as well. What do we use for that? Synoptic maps. Synoptic maps are maps of the whole surface of the sun, the magnetic fields over the whole surface of the sun, except that we cannot build them. They are not real, uh, real time magnetic field measurements because we are using measurements like this one. You will on only have a sliver uh, where you have fresh fields. All the other fields are old and some of them, they are 27 days old. And that is extremely limiting. Look at the poles. Look at the, we basically don't have reliable measurement there. And these measurements at the poles are extremely important for the models that, that we are having we, to drive the, the coronal and hemispheric models. Let me give you, let me show an example here. Uh, let me, you see this small active, active region here, it starts emerging and within one day, it gave an X-class flare except that this immersion, it, it occurs outside of that yellow circle I showed earlier. So with this type of events, we cannot really do much. And by the way, this event is well connected to us, to Earth, and it can cause quite a bit of stuff. <clears throat> and obviously, we need to understand the whole system when you look at the solar cycle, space weather, we need, to have, we need to have an understanding at what, what is going on from the interior of the sun all the way to the solar wind. And we know it now for decades, we cannot do it from the ecliptic using a single viewpoint. What we have to do, change the way we observe the sun. It, we have a chance, the sun is actually the only star in the whole universe that we, that we can observe <coughs> as a whole a thing that we never did before. What we need to do in the future, first of all, we need to fly above the solar poles. 
because without the views of the poles, we cannot have a handle on the solar cycle and the dynamo in the interior of the solar cycle. We need to get those measurements above the poles of the sun. The other thing, we need also full coverage of the sun to understand the flows of the interior of the sun, understand the evolution of the magnetic fields of the sun, and basically have a full understanding of what is going on from the uh, Taku line where the fields are, are, are born all the way to the solar wind. The only way to do it, a constellation of spacecrafts. You have some of them in the ecliptic, some of them will fly above the solar poles. That way you have a four pi steroidian coverage of the whole sun, and that way you will not miss anything. What we are advocating for is what a mission, mission concept we call, we call the Firefly. It's two spacecrafts that will stay in the ecliptic. Initially, they will start drif drifting like stereo, but at when, we, when they reach an angular distance uh, from Earth that is between 90 to 120 degrees, we'll park them there and they will start orbiting the sun at the same orbital speed as Earth. This triangle alone, that is the two spacecraft in Earth, will provide 75% coverage of the solar surface. Add to them two more spacecrafts that will, that will fly as high as 70 degrees latitude. That will give you, at any given time, over 85% coverage. At even given, most of the time is way, way above 95%. This is exactly what we need going, going forward to the future. In terms of science, this is what we want to address. It goes from the internal structure of the sun to the flows, to the solar dynamo, to magnetic fields of the surface, to the activity in the, in the, uh, in the, in the atmosphere, to the solar wind, to space weather, to the solar cycle, and you add to it the synergetic science. This is what we want to do with this mission. We do the whole system at once. And um, I see a lot of young people around here. This mission is for you. If whatever, whatever domain you want to get involved in, this mission will give you it. It's, in my view, that's the mission we have to go, to go with in the going forward. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any question if you have any. Thank you, Noor. I mm -hmm. think we have time for questions. I'm going to try to bring the microphone to whoever wants to. Get priority. Ah, uh, okay. okay. Questions? Okay, over there. So I have to. Sorry, Ralph. Yes. <laughs> I was expecting. Uh, hi, first, uh, great talk. Uh, so I had a question about the uh, reconnection work uh, from the BBSO data that you showed. Uh, so if you're just looking at <clears throat> like a photospheric uh, magnetograph or magnetogram, right, uh, the reconnection of two field lines can look a lot like the subduction of a small scale loop, right? So you could have two points moving, you know, two magnetic field points moving close to each other without cancellation because they're the same field line. And I'm guessing, I, I just want to know, uh, have you done anything in your analysis to distinguish between those two cases? Uh, and I guess a similar question, like what percentage of those, you know, quote unquote cancellation events need to actually be reconnection to explain the jet lets and coronal heating uh, that you see in the EUV? Excellent question. Uh, there has been some analysis done on that. I said in 90 minutes over that 70 by 70 arc seconds, we had something like, uh, 1,500 uh, bipole canceling, a very small number of them resulted into speakers and jetlets. I think um, 60 of them produced speakers, and much less of them produced the jetlets. So we, we know of those. You need a very, very tiny fraction of them to make it higher up to the, to the solar wind. You don't, want a, you don't want all of that reconnection supplying mass to the corona. Otherwise, the corona will be too dense, and it's a problem. So we don't need that. But when you run the, um, the calculations, assuming that uh, that reconnection is going all over the solar surface, you get, uh, at any given time, you need about 2,000 jetlets ongoing. And the rate at which you produce jetlets is about six jetlets per second. 
that will be what you will get to drive the solar wind. Our estimation that we get more than twice that number. Do we need all of it? No. But it's still useful because we believe that there is a selection effect. Not all the plasma that is thrown into the corona will make it higher up. Some of it will, flow, will, will, will drop down back to the sun. So have, having a higher number is not necessarily a problem. But to your questions, we don't need all that reconnection to make it higher up to the corona. We don't need that. We need just a tiny bit of it. Hey, great talk. Uh, somewhat related question uh, about the uh, ubiquitous uh, reconnection at very small scales as you get higher and higher resolution observations. Uh, I'm curious about the, uh, like, I assume that this follows the same sort of power spectrum as uh, regular flares, micro flares, nano flares. How far down uh, in scale does that go and how uh, significant is that in terms of like the overall energy uh, budget and just you know that sort of thing believe it or not what is it Kevin I asked the same question to Kevin earlier <laughs> saying okay suppo suppose that you have an infinite an instrument that give you an infinite resolution to what point we will reach the, the building blocks of the field honestly we don't know but as you go higher, higher, and higher resolution, the field will break down into the salt and pepper structure. And the more pipes you have, the more potential reconnection you will have. And that's so useful because you need a lot of energy to keep the corona hot, because otherwise the corona will cool down. So having more of this is not, is not necessarily a problem. Now, when, we, when I said earlier that, yeah, the spectrum will plus probably lead us to the nano flares, that's all speculation. We need to, we need to wait for high and higher resolution to see what, uh, what is going on. And just to, um, to, re to comment on the resolution um, argument, oftentimes people, when they look at the um, AUV images and magnetic fields, they use data with the same resolution. My personal experience is that in order to have the right interpretation of what we see in the EUV, you need magnetograms at three to five times higher resolution than the EUV. It's like the um, BBSO with, with SDO. SDO is about one arc second. BBSO is 0.2 arc second. That's five times. Uh, if you use HMI to interpret um, the AAA, you will, not, you will not get what you want. So, and go there and then. So, how about postdocs? Do they get priorities? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Very, very interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, comment and a question. Comment is you've not mentioned the word electric fields. And the question is that in these switchbacks, is the spatial scale of the reversing magnetic fields sufficiently small that electric that you're going to have strong electric fields that will create heating we don't have evidence uh, from the data on that I cannot say that doesn't exist but as far as I know we don't have it uh, we don't have evidence for that but there is a recent paper and now I'm talking much larger scale than the switchbacks a recent paper by He's from the University of Iowa, Jasper Halakas, where he found, yeah, you have an electric field that probably will accelerate the wind, but the very slow wind, it's not the, the whole wind, just the very slow wind, but that's on a very much larger scale. It's not the switchbacks. That's where the electric fields come in. Yeah. Okay, it's worth pursuing that topic. Sure, absolutely. So a postdoc. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, actually, I have a general, very general question. I remember in a very famous Ulysses observation, solar acti wind structure is very di different between a solar minimum and a maximum. And uh, now it's approaching to solar maximum. And uh, what's, what is the plan for Parker Solar Top to observe in the upcoming maximum? And uh, how, what are you expecting? Or um, 
Well, let me talk about the plan. The plan is to get close and closer to the sun. Yeah. Uh -huh. And honestly, we have no choice. Gravity will dictate what oh, we yeah, have yeah. to do. So that's the plan. Um, in terms of what we expect, mm -hmm. we don't know. And that's actually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, uh, just on September 5th, we got the, the top five fa fastest CME in the recorded history. And it hit Parker Solar Probe when it was at 13th already. Mm -hmm. uh, we are just looking at that data as, as we speak. We had, a, uh, we had a workshop last week about it. It is so interesting. And it's comp the view we are getting from the data is completely different from what we are using to uh, at one AU. And by the way, Parker Solar Probe was really l almost going to fly through the structure. So um, going to maximum, the hope is that we get more and more of these events. Uh, it, they will help us tremendously into understanding the energization of energetic particles, how they gain so much energies. Mm -hmm. We need a lot of events like that. Um, other than that is, uh, I hope we'll make discoveries that we don't know about now. And that's, that's, that's the plan. Okay, that's, yeah, that's so interesting. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, another postdoc. That's post postdoc Valentine. <laughs> <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, your almost last slide showed uh, a whole lot of uh, areas of interest. Scientific, uh, that's the one. Something that's missing from there, I notice, is the connection between the sun and stars. There's no solar stellar science in there. And let me. Um, just suggest that if you can measure something that's of interest from a distance of parsecs away, the, the real advantage of being able to look at other stars is that you get, um, in the first place, stars that have different structure because their masses and ages are different. And maybe much more important from this aspect is um, different rotation rates. Absolutely. A lot different. Yes. Factors of 100. Mm -hmm. Uh, and those are extremely important in how magnetic fields evolve. And so I wonder if you have any comment about that. Um, well, obviously the sun is, is a single star. And uh, the, it's obvious that we can cover all these fields because the sun is very close to us. But your comment is exactly right. I mean, uh, what, the, what we gain from addressing all these uh, fields in detail is more knowledge that we can probably can project on other stars as well. Also, the, the other stars are, can be very, very different. But still, some of the physics might be the same. Um, but that's definitely that connection between the two. It's, it's, it's a whole, whole different, different discussion to, to be had. So I'm going to make the last question, which is related to uh, what Tim Brown was saying which is at the beginning when the switchbacks were related um, to the angular momentum of the sun, how the sun is losing angular momentum, it was expected that they are important, and that might be important for other stars. So where are we with switchbacks and angular momentum losses from the sun? Uh, have we made any progress from the early papers? That, that's a very good question. Okay, let me give a little bit of background that people know what we are talking about here. What, one of the instruments on Parker Solar Pro initially gave us uh, tangential flows in the direction of rotation of the sun that are 20 to 30 times what the state of the art model predicted. And when you look at the model, basically when you are low down, the magnetic field dominates the plasma, so it rotates rigidly with the sun. But beyond the uh, alphanic critical uh, boundary, that rigid